This brings us to the fourth part of our tutorial, research quantifying the link between increasing carbon dioxide concentrations and global temperature. As you can see, temperatures are going up, but not smoothly. There's considerable month-to-month -month noise, but also multi-decade fluctuations, although on multi-decade timescales we do see that warming has been proceeding reasonably steadily since the 1970s. One of the first scientists to make the point that we need to consider the interactions between natural and human-induced warming to interpret the observed record was Wally Broker in the early 1970s. And he also appears, by the way, to have coined the term global warming. His theory of natural multi-decadal cycles hasn't really stood the test of time, but his fundamental insight is spot on, that we are seeing a combination of natural fluctuations and human-induced warming and that natural variability is just as likely to mask a human-induced warming as it is to contribute towards it. Much of the debate over climate change is hampered by a rather unhelpful binary distinction between the positions it's all natural and it's all human-induced, when the reality, of course, is that both natural and human factors have contributed to observed changes over the past 150 years, with human influence emerging as the dominant cause of the recent warming since the 1970s. Uh, we now digress briefly to discuss past natural climate changes before the advent of industrial activity. The court asked specifically about the origins of the so-called Little Ice Age, which was a period of cooler temperatures around 1600. Its origins remain debated, but it can be explained as a consequence of higher volcanic activity and lower solar activity during this period. Whether it would have ended naturally when it did is also unclear because human factors can't be neglected from the 19th century onwards. There's also a lot of debate about whether the temperatures in the so-called medieval warm period around the year 1000 were warmer than they are today. The evidence currently suggests that they weren't, but naturally reconstructions of global temperatures from a limited number of proxy observations are very uncertain. Crucially, however, none of this has much bearing on our understanding of the causes of recent climate change because we don't know what the sun was doing a thousand years ago, but we do know that solar activity has been declining at least since 1992, thanks to satellite observations. So even if solar activity could explain the medieval warm period, it can't explain the warming trend we're seeing right now. On longer timescales, ice ages are thought to be triggered by periodic variations in the Earth's orbit around the sun and axis of rotation. These variations are shown in grey in the top three lines in this diagram, with temperature changes in the tropics in red and Antarctica in purple shown below on the same scale. These are based on observations of marine sediments and ice cores over, going back over the past 800,000 years. Notice the clear sawtooth pattern of roughly 100,000 year cycles of a gradual cooling followed by a sudden warming. Interestingly, carbon dioxide concentrations, shown in green, also rise and fall along with temperatures, as warmer oceans expel CO2 into the atmosphere. CO2 isn't directly triggering the ice ages, but it is acting to reinforce the impact of solar variability. On even longer timescales, tens of millions of years, we can see the impact of CO2, in that ice only appeared in Antarctica around 34 million years ago, after carbon dioxide levels dropped to around 600 parts per million. So low carbon dioxide levels appear to be a necessary condition for ice ages to occur, but other factors are needed to set them off. Of course, this observation does raise the question of whether Antarctic ice could survive a period, a prolonged period, of elevated CO2 concentrations. This brings us back to quantifying how human and natural influences have affected global climate on historical timescales. This graph shows the key factors affecting climate over the past century in terms of their impact on the global energy balance. These are relatively well known. We know the impact of rising greenhouse gases, shown in red here. We know the impact of volcanoes, shown in green, these cooling spikes. We certainly know when the volcanoes occurred, although the size of the spikes, in the pre-satellite era at least, is uncertain. We also know that the power output of the sun has gone up and down slightly over this period as well. We know the climate system conserves energy, 
so it doesn't respond instantly to these schooling, cooling spikes, but it smooths them out a bit. This is the only piece of additional information we need to assess the contributions of these different drivers to the observed global temperature record. We begin by trying to explain the observed record with natural factors alone. This is a kind of what-if exercise. What if CO2 has no impact on global temperature? Can we explain the record? The blue line shows the best fit to observe temperatures since 1900, allowing any amount of amplification of the responses to low and high frequency components of solar variability and to volcanic activity. Getting even this level of fit required me to scale up the response to low frequency solar variations by more than a factor of 10. Uh, many would find that already physically implausible, but the Sun Climate Research Community has various theories about how such an amplification might occur. Crucially, however, solar activity appears to have declined since the continuous satellite record began in 1992, so it cannot explain the recent warming. So the fit's not very good, and it's not just that there's an unexplained trend, but that, that trend kicks off around 1970, precisely when the combined warming response to human influence was expected to take off. So the scientific response is to follow the data and allow some contribution of human influence to observe temperatures. What we do, which may seem somewhat perverse, but it's the way hypothesis testing works, is we pretend we're completely ignorant of how large the contribution from human influence might be and start by assuming CO2 emissions to date have caused, for example, only one tenth of a degree of warming. This improves the agreement slightly, but not much. So we go up to two tenths, three, Notice how total human-induced warming is somewhat higher than CO2-induced warming because of the well-understood additional contributions of methane and other forms of pollution. Four, five, six, seven. Now it starts to look like we've got a reasonable explanation of the observed warming, still with some contribution from natural factors, but most of the warming due to human activity. If we go up to eight, nine, or a whole degree of CO2-induced warming to date, that appears to be too much. We're now seeing that purple line there way above the observed temperatures in over the recent decades. So we reduce it again, and we end up with the best fit with no unexplained residual, suspiciously resembling the, the expected response to human-induced warming, with about 0.8 degrees of carbon dioxide-induced warming to date. In doing this, I've assumed the climate response to other forms of pollution, like methane, ozones, and aerosols, varies along with the response of CO2. I could relax that assumption, but that would take longer and it doesn't change the overall point. This exercise was to explain how we quantify the influence of human activity on global climate. We don't rely on models to tell us how large this influence might be, but we estimate it from the data. And we start off with the null hypothesis that human influence is negligible. Of course, actual attribution studies, starting from the work of Ben Santer, Gabriel Hegel, and Klaus Hasselmann in the mid-1990s, have used much more than just global average temperature, but this simple demonstration is the principle of what they were doing. There's also more to explain in how we assign an uncertainty to this assessment. But uncertainty cuts both ways. 0.8th of a degree of warming due to CO2 could be an overestimate, but it could equally be an underestimate. None of this changes the fact that the most likely explanation of observed warming is that it is predominantly human-induced, with around 80% of it arising from carbon dioxide emissions. Even in 1990, the IPCC first assessment report concluded the observed increase could be largely due to this natural variability. Alternatively, this natural variability and other human factors could have offset a still larger human-induced greenhouse warming. It's very important to read both halves of that sentence. Even back then, scientists were giving equal weight to the possibility that greenhouse warming was actually larger than total observed warming, as to the possibility that it was smaller. So we don't actually need complicated climate models to conclude that carbon dioxide is the dominant cause of the observed warming. Complex models, however, confirm this conclusion. This graph shows the latest generation of climate models used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, sampled in the same way that observations are sampled, and this shows that they're essentially indistinguishable from the observed warming, if driven with a combination of natural factors and rising greenhouse gases, that's shown in yellow and orange, but completely inconsistent with the observed warming if the impact of rising greenhouse gases is left out, that's shown in blue. The importance of sampling both models and observations in the same way was actually only recognized quite recently, 
So some of the figures in the most recent IPCC assessment are rather misleading because they suggest a systematic warm bias in these models in recent years. So the past 20 years have seen a progressive increase in our confidence in rejecting the null hypothesis of a zero or small human influence on global climate. But throughout that time, the conclusion of the IPCC's first assessment report back in 1990, that natural factors could just as likely to be counteracting a human-induced warming, i.e. masking a greater warming than observed, as they are to be acting to reinforce human-induced warming, that conclusion has not changed. This is important because from the perspective of a, a risk assessment, the question of what level of confidence we can reject the null hypothesis of no human influence on climate is rather moot when our best estimate is that all of the observed warming is due to human influence. As a scientist who's worked on the attribution chapters of IPCC ever since the 1990s, I, I'm often teased by colleagues for obsessing over questions that don't really tell us anything new in effect, they just confirm what Charney had good reason to suspect back in 1979. The danger noted by the Charney report of waiting for a detectable signal before taking action also applies to sea level. The map shows the pattern of sea level change published in the IPCC fifth assessment report spanning the period of the altimeter record from 1993 to 2012. The IPCC fifth assessment report was published in 2013. Over this period, sea level fell near San Francisco. Notice the blue shading on the map. On the definition of detection used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which requires a change of the expected sign that's also distinguishable from internal climate variability, there was no detectable sea level rise in San Francisco in the altimeter record from 1993 to 2012. But if we look at the top left panel from exactly the same IPCC figure, Comparing tide gauge records since 1950, shown in grey, with the global average sea level shown in red, it's clear that the lack of a rise over the 1993 to 2012 period is due to natural variability. The IPCC noted this fact in their figure caption, and that the internal variability over that short period was masking the longer term trend of rising sea level, with sea level in San Francisco rising along with the global average. Confirmation of this is provided by the altimeter record since 2012, and this shows a much more uniform pattern of rise over the full 1993 to 2018 period, including the US West Coast. The final part of our tutorial turns to a more recent insight, which is the permanent cumulative impact of carbon dioxide emissions on climate. Charney, Nordhaus and others all agreed in the 1970s it was necessary to reduce emissions to control the global temperature rise. But it only became apparent in the 2000s just how far they had to be reduced.